When I was a child, my grandfather often took me to the Natural History Museum in Jerusalem. This was and still is a very old and romantic building. I was still very small and he had to lift me so I could press all the buttons to operate the brain and the heart models. When I was a bit older, I earned some pocket money patrolling the galleries to make sure that nobody touched the exhibits. I was also lucky to have had some amazing mentors at the museum who introduced me to science. As a scientist, I appreciate the huge importance of natural history museums all over the world. These institutes have the dual mission of performing research and of educating the public in an accessible and fun manner. I'm very excited to stand here inside the brand new Steinhardt Museum of Natural History in Tel Aviv. Since ancient times, people have been classifying animals. Classification seems to be a basic human instinct and is essential for studying and understanding life. Our current system of classification is based on the 250 years old method Carl Linnaeus designed. Taxonomy, the science of classifying organisms into groups, is a complex and important branch of biology. Unfortunately, taxonomy was not considered fashionable for many years. However, in view of its huge importance for understanding biological diversity and conservation, its importance is now being rediscovered. In addition to its traditional use of morphology, taxonomy is becoming more and more based on DNA analysis. The basic taxonomy unit is species. Generally, organisms belong to the same species if they can breed and produce fertile offspring. Above species, there are several higher levels of organization, genus, family, order, class, and phylum. According to the method of Linnaeus, each species has a dual name. For example, chimpanzees are called pantroglodytes. They belong to the family of great apes, which belongs to the order of primates. Primates belong to the class of mammals, which belongs to the subphylum of vertebrates that are part of the animal kingdom. There are other kingdoms, most notably the plant kingdom. In this course, we will meet animals from different groups, vertebrates, insects, spiders, mollusks, worms, starfish, and many more. We will introduce these groups here in a few words and present them while we walk through the galleries of the museum. Vertebrates are animals that have backbones. They make up less than 5% of animal species on Earth. But if I ask you to think of an animal, you would probably choose a vertebrate. Vertebrates are divided into several groups you probably know pretty well. Fish live in water and breathe by using gills. They have scales and fins and they cannot control their body temperature. Most fish lay eggs. We will meet fish in this course when we discuss gender flexibility. The four remaining classes of vertebrates are amphibians, reptiles, birds and mammals. They all have four limbs and most of them are terrestrial. Amphibians include salamanders and newts that have a tail and frogs and toads that lack one. They have a smooth, moist skin and lay their delicate, jelly-covered eggs in water. We will meet amphibians in the course when we discuss external fertilization. We will also learn about the unique metamorphosis they undergo from tadpole to adults. Reptiles include turtles, snakes, lizards and crocodiles, which we have already met. Also, the extinct dinosaurs were reptiles. Reptiles have scaly skin that enables them to live in very dry environments. Most reptiles lay eggs, but they are very different from the eggs of amphibians or fish. Their eggs are laid out of the water and have a protective soft leathery shell. We will discuss reptiles when we will learn about sex determination. Birds are the only type of animals that have feathers. They have two legs and wings. As you have already seen with the ostrich, not all of them can fly. Birds are warm-blooded and maintain a constant body temperature. They lay eggs, but unlike the eggs of reptiles, theirs have a hard shell. There are about 10,000 known species of birds. We will meet birds many times in this course. We will discuss their pairing, their parental care, their sex determination and much more. The last group of vertebrates we are going to talk about are mammals. You have already watched many different mammals in the movie from our safari. There are about 5,000 known species of mammals. Like birds, mammals are warm-blooded and breathe air. Even mammals that live underwater must come to the surface for air. Mammals have fur or hair. The largest animals that live on land, elephants, and in the sea, whales, are mammals. Almost all mammals give birth to live young instead of laying eggs, 
and all mammals feed their babies milk. We will meet mammals many, many times in this course. In this course, we will meet many animals that are not vertebrates. These were traditionally all called invertebrates, but this is a rather inappropriate and outdated term. We are here in the gallery devoted to arthropods, the group with the largest number of species of all animal phyla. I'm standing here next to the exhibit that shows the different groups of arthropods. Here are the insects, here are the spiders, here are the crabs, scorpions, millipedes. That one up there is a horseshoe crab, a real living fossil that has been around for 450 million years and is still going strong. About 60% of all animal species are insects. Did you know that there are about 300,000 different beetle species? Arthropods have an external skeleton, which they have to replace as they grow. Many of them undergo metamorphosis as they mature. We will discuss this transformation in a later part of the course. Here is a mold of an ant nest, reminding us that some insects live in huge colonies. We will learn about their social and sex life later in the course. <music>